Welcome in to the CHGO White Sox podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top rated sportsbook. Download the app today and use promo code CHGO when you sign up. Welcome into our CHGO studios here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm the host of the CHGO White Sox podcast, Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And alongside me, as always, is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader, leading that community, leading those diehards. And make sure if you are interested in becoming a member of our CHGO family, you'd be interested in becoming a diehard member uh, of the the CHGO family, uh, check out allchgo.com. And look at you. You got diehard fans. Duke Eaton saying, let's go Herb. Let's go Duke. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You know? Uh, I might have met him. Well, you know Herb's a big Eaton fan in general. I do That's love true. I do yeah. love Eaton's. Well, yeah. Mark. I mean, Adam. Adam. Rest, rest in peace. Not, not him. That's um, Duke, of course. My favorite Eaton. <laughs> and uh, Slash Poppy is my favorite Poppy. Uh, you know, I love Slush Poppy. He's, he's the Slush. Slush Poppy hooked us up with some tickets uh, and was great. Thank you very much, guy. All right, guy. I appreciate seeing you in the chat again. Yes, and uh, today we're going to be talking about Mark Burley's candidacy for the Hall of Fame. The ballots are out for the 2023 uh, class, and we will see the entire ballot. We'll have our own mock ballots. We'll have, uh, give you our votes for who we'd vote for if we had votes. And we'll also kind of lay out the path for how Mark Burley could be a Hall of Famer or how we could just drag this out for fun. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll also talk a little bit about some trade murmurs and some free agent murmurs uh, around Jose Abreu. Uh, but let's jump into the Hall of Fame stuff first. And let's talk about our guy, Mark Burley. There mm -hmm. are some former White Sox on this ballot. Um, you got Jimmy Rollins. Yep. Manny Ramirez. Yep. Greats. <laughs> Greats. I mean, Jimmy Rollins deserves Hall of Fame consideration just for his role in getting Adam LaRoche and his kid, Drake, off of the White Sox in 2016. Mercy. I um, think 2016, wasn't it? Yeah. That sounds right. It does. Uh, it also, it's a hell of a bad year for the White Sox. Yeah, uh, Andrew Jones, also a uh, former White Sox great, who is, who's, uh, and there's the other one, Omar Vizcal, but we ridiculous. don't really need to bring him up just ridiculous that Andrew Jones is not in the Hall of Fame already I agree and uh we'll, we'll get to the ballots later um and hey his, his kid's gonna be a Hall of Famer his own right Drew Jones uh, got drafted what first overall or second overall behind Jackson uh beside Holiday. Matt, yeah, Matt Holiday's kid. yeah still <laughs> Matt Holiday still hasn't touched home plate in Colorado versus the Padres I think the only people who care are people from San Diego and me too um and you uh and then Holiday's now what bench coach for the Cardinals is he? He just yeah. got hired? Okay, cool. I think he's uh, Marmol's bench coach. So Congratulations. A uh, little, little interest in there. Um, but yeah, the other uh, that was the other uh, White Sox. Uh, and then you also have, obviously, Mark Burley. Uh, so a little bit on Mark Burley, because I think he's the one we care about the most here. We got the bobblehead on the table in front of us. Uh, outside of Mark Burley, Who is there anyone that you really was like, no, he had a good White Sox career. Manny, Andrew Jones, Jimmy Rollins, Omar Vizquel. No, none of those guys had a really good White Sox career. Andrew Jones did hit his 400th home run as a White Sox. But otherwise, those guys were much more themselves or on this ballot because of their previous stops before they got to the White Sox. Andrew Jones was probably at the end of his career. And I remember my guy, Adam Harris, who used to work at the score, was excited. He was like, this is my favorite baseball player ever. He's playing in my town. And he was decent for the White Sox. I think after that, he went to the Yankees. I don't know what he did with the Yankees, but uh, I enjoyed playing or him playing for the White Sox. And my favorite story about Andrew Jones is me calling as a score producer in my young career. They were at the Fister Hotel, which is in Milwaukee. Spell with a P, Fister Hotel. Um, for the All-Star Game, the one that got tied, I think is in 2002. And so you do this thing called Hotel Roulette. You call up the hotel that you know that they're at, and you just ask for their name. And so I called the reception. I was like, hey, can I speak to Andrew Jones? And they left me up to his room. I was like, hey, Andrew. He's like, it's Andrew. And then pretty much hung up. <laughs> it's spelled on. I was like, all right, man. You're just trying to be polite, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's fault. the way I, I thought it was pronounced up until that point. But, yeah, he's like, it's Andrew. Hung up. It's Andrew. I don't I don't too much blame him. I would hang up with any random stranger who said my name incorrectly and also wanted me to come on some midday show in Chicago. <laughs> well, I see Steven Niss in the chat. So, Steven, our guy, uh, Steven, uh, I was going to say Nichols. Steven Nicholas, nice. our producer. Uh, if someone calls you on Hotel Roulette and was like, what's up, Steve? Did you no. hang up? Is that an immediate hang as up? As much as I hate Steve, you know what the worst one for me is? Stevie? No, because my name's spelled with a PH, Stefan. 
Ooh. I oh. get that all the time. Hate it. And I always correct it, too. Well, shout out to Stefan Niss, then, in our chat. If, if, if you hate it, then he probably hates Maybe it his too. name is Stefan. No, he's Stephen. Okay. Niss. I, yeah, You've no. met Stephen? I think it... Now I feel now you're making me See? second guess See? myself, but no, I mean, he's he's on. Oh, he says on truth. Twitter. So yes, but it, about what? It's Stephen Ness. Yeah, no, I know it's Stephen. I think it's Kness. I don't know about that. I I'm gonna pass on that one. Uh, but Mark Burley uh, is the guy that we care about most. He obviously yep. had the best White Sox career. Uh, what's your favorite memory of Mark Burley? Before we get into all this, because Mark Burley, obviously, longtime White Sox, twelve years with the Sox from uh, 2000 uh, to 2011. We also got the World Series uh, little display here out here as well. As he was a part of the uh, 2005 team. What's your favorite memory of uh, old Mark? There's so many with him, um, but my favorite is not actually on the field necessarily. It's when he used to come during rain delays and slide on the tarp all like all the length of the tarp. And Kenny Williams put an end to that because he's like, you get, you're going to get hurt. You know, you, there's a base under there. There's a mound under there. There's you know the, the rubber there. You're going to get hurt. But uh, he put an end to that. But that was just like showing that he's such a kid. He's such a guy that just like. I don't care. He's like, I'm having fun. I'm at a baseball stadium. I'm the 30, I'm in a 38th round pick and I'm in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a great time out here. And that's what he did. And on his off days, he would more than likely catch the first pitch from whoever was throwing this out the ceremonial first pitch. What a thrill. Usually now nowadays you'll get a Gavin Sheets. You'll get somebody else unless you're connected to that specific person. Like, um, when the baby came, Tim Anderson went out there and caught it. But a new, initially, you're going to get somebody down the line. Danny meant to go out in there and catch. But Mark Burley's like, no, I'm going to catch you. Mm -hmm. And go out and talk to the people, give them an autograph, say what's up. He was just the consummate professional, the everyday man, got the job done. And so when he, I saw him sliding on the tarp, I was like, man, that seems like fun. And that's something I would do, too. And that guy's a Major League Baseball player. He's just taking this game so lightly. It's so great. Yeah, uh, when he got his jersey retired, uh, one of the quotes that stuck out to me from that entire ceremony was, I was just here having fun playing baseball. Next thing you know, they're retiring my number. I It just doesn't make sense. Um, and it really doesn't make sense because, oh. again, like you mentioned, 38th rounder, I think I believe it was. that was his round. Um, was it 38? Which I don't think we go that far anymore. It's a 40. Yeah, 38th round. Uh, no, and, and 38 rounder, I think the only person that I know of that is – like had a huge career in the MLB was Mike Piazza, mm -hmm. who was famously like one of the last picks of the MLB draft in the eighties when there was like 70 <laughs> rounds of it. And the only reason he got picked was because he's Tommy Lasorda's godson. Um, yeah. Turns out pretty good baseball player as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, he, he got picked uh, near the end. So I think the only former other Marlins like, great. Yes. Mike Piazza. Yes. yes. Uh, and former, uh, I think he was a Cardinal as well. <laughs> yeah, so it's like just, Piazza. I mean, there's many other ones I could have gone with. I mean, I loved it, and you brought it up in pre-production. He wasn't here, but it's when the Toronto Blue Jays came back here, and I don't know who the manager at the time, maybe John Gibbons or somebody at John Farrell, t told all the rest of the players to let Mark Burley take the field by himself. And if that would have been known by Mark Burley before the game, he would have put the kibosh on that. Mm -hmm. Like, no, nah, no, nah, we're, we're a team. I'll go out there with my team. He went out there by himself and got the standing ovation from the White Sox fans. And it was like a, you know, a heart, like warming moment, like finally getting his due because he left not abruptly, but for the most part during that time, I thought Mark Burley was going to come back before he signed that four year deal with the Mar Marlins. He wanted to come back. The White Sox in essence chose John Danks over Mark Burley. Well, and it was a weird moment, too, because not only was Mark Burley leaving, it was also Ozzie Guillen leaving. Mm -hmm. And there was also the point, and I forget which exact season it was, so forgive me there, I think it was 2009, where at the trade deadline, it wasn't sure if Mark was even going to yeah. stay with the Sox because it was, you know, are they going to extend him? Are they not going to extend him? So there was kind of some tumultuous times there um, after the 2005 World Series championship where I think that would be most people's favorite memory of him, uh, either it being uh, his performance, you know, starting. Uh, in, in the World Series or him getting drunk in the bullpen and then coming out in <laughs> game three and getting the save in that one. Uh, but, you know, it, it, he also in that 2009 uh, season had the perfect game. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the only players in MLB pitcher in, in history uh, with three outings of facing the minimum 27 up 27 down. He did it in his no hitter at the G rate. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that was 2007. 
uh, in yeah, April of 2007. Yep. Versus um, the Texas Rangers. The only ba- batter he allowed was uh, Sammy, Sosa. Sammy Sosa, and then he picked him off. And then against the Guardians, formerly Indians the, at the time. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, I know you have no issue saying that. That's my shit. <laughs> Um, in 2002, uh, he had a uh, uh, 27 up, 27 down, where he allowed two base runners and got them out with uh, two ground and uh, uh, two uh, GIDPs. Mm-hmm. Um, so Mark Burley, a very unique history, but again, 38 ra- 38th rounder, weren't really expecting it. Was taken in 1998 too, and then yeah. made it into the major leagues in 2000. Yeah, so like just bang, <laughs> made it up there. Um, and his whole mo was, you know, soft contact, but. That leads me to my favorite memory of Mark Burley, and sorry for the long windedness there. But uh, 2009, Mark Burley, July 23rd, 2009. Correct. Uh, I don't. I think I've told the story on the podcast before. Uh, but I was at Brother Ice Sports Camp, and my dad picked me up. He's like, "Hey, what are you? What are we doing today? You know, want to go to the Sox game?" I'm like, "Sure, why not?" Uh, So he goes and picks up a buddy, and me, my dad, and my buddy, or his buddy, uh, go to the Sox game, and uh, we get there about. Uh, an inning after because Mark Burley works quick. So we probably got there at 110 and, you know, probably were at our seats at 113 and Mark Burley was already done with the first three guys because mm-hmm. um, he just works that damn quick. Um, and I look up and I said, oh, dad, we're probably gonna see a perfect game today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Um, little did I know seven innings later, I'd be hyperventilating into a Dippin' Dots bag, <laughs> cookies and cream, my friend, uh, because Mark Burley uh, <laughs> has done it. And Mark Burley uh, has pitched perfection. And I was in 161. Mm. right in front of Dwayne Wise, I think uh, row 17, okay. seats one, two, and three. Um, so it was a real nice view, but it was kind of the, one of those things where I was so short. So everyone stood up when the ball started coming to left field. I couldn't see anything, so I just heard the gasp, the, <gasps> and then everyone saw that he came down, and you can hear it in the call. I mean, it's just truly the whole stadium went silent when he went to the ground, and then when he got up and held it up, everyone erupted, and that is just the most vivid memory I have in my life is being at a perfect game in a baseball stadium. Uh, so Do you I, remember who hit that ball? Uh, yeah. Gabe Kapler, current, exactly. current manager of the, uh, of the, uh, of the race. Do you know who caught that game? You got it. Uh, uh, you, not the race. You, the Giants. You, got, I know you had it right. Um, uh, yeah. And do I know who caught it? Yeah. Dwayne Weiss. No, no, but who caught the, who <laughs> caught the game? Ramon Castro. All right. Who was the final out? Uh, Jason Bartlett. All right, your, your memory's pretty. A good lot of there. Jasons. Um, do you remember who the who the second out of that ninth inning was? Uh, it was another catcher that sucked. His Mark Burley went three and one on him, and then came back and got him out. I okay, forgot it was a. <laughs> this is way too photographed. I forgot. Who, I forgot his name. Um, but he was a little pudgier catcher. I forgot his last name though. It, uh, Michael, but uh, spelled Michelle. Um, okay. Michelle Hernandez. Okay. Um, yeah, not 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 too memorable, but you know, you might re- remember Gabe Kapler because he's still around. Jason Bartlett, former All Star. You're not gonna remember and a lot of That's the catcher. And the reason why I kind of remember is because I told this story too. I was at that game pre-game. Mm-hmm. The score had um, the White Sox at the time had the rights up until what 2016 or 15. So I was there at that doing a production for, I think, Mac and Spiegel or somebody like that. So at the remote, in the Ranji booth, did that show. Chris Collins, who was the sports director at the time, called me back to the studio and said, hey, we got a extra work for you to do here at the studio. Can you come and do it? I was like, yeah. So I took the red line back to the NBC Tower, did my work, tuned the game in, and then that happened. And right when it happened, right when that last out was gone, I pretty much – Savored it a little bit and booked it out of there because I didn't want Mitch to see me because I know, Herbie, Herbie, help us out. We need tape, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I've been at the stadium since like 8 o'clock in the morning. And right now it was probably like 4 or no, 3 o'clock. So it really works quickly. So I was like, I'm going my ass home. Yeah. So I booked it out of there. I asked the guy who gave out tickets to give me a, a ticket that he had still in his uh, possession. And I got one of those tickets. I don't know what I did with it, but from here on out, even though I'm documenting right now, if I ever have kids, grandkids, I'm like, hey, I was at that game. <laughs> Hell yeah, kids. I, I gotta, mean, you actually were at yeah, the game, and I you got, probably still have the ticket with you. I got a shadow box, and my dad got a jersey, and we got the two tickets there. It's it's real nice. It's real choice uh, for it's friends. Just, just, I couldn't, like, you can't, like, there's not a person in this on this earth that hates Mark Burley, except for Joe, uh, Joe, Joe West. West. Yeah. That's it. Well, and Joe West just hates That's the White it. Sox, and I hate Joe West. And how do you throw out Mark Burley? Well, just a 
dick. We'll talk about Joe West and how he's kind of soiling some of these great numbers Mark Burley has. Um, we'll also get into our uh, mock ballots as well. Um, there was one more point I wanted to bring up. Oh, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, ducking out of the score. Uh, probably a different office because you were at the NBC Tower at that yep. point. Uh, but, yeah, if, if if I was in your spot at that point, that's one of those days where you walk out the W. BBM side of the yeah. last the last office we were in. Yeah, I'm not walking past. I'm not walking past that hallway. You know. Yeah. Luckily, Mitch's office was closer to the actual on air studios. I was in one of the many auxiliary studios that we had back in the day. You know, it's it's a weird thing. We in the ninth floor of a uh, the Prudential Plaza, we had like two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this place had like six. So I was just in one of those studios. He didn't see me the whole day, which was great because I on purpose went to one of the auxiliary studios that is on the other side of the building, and then. Booked it out of there as soon as it, because I knew it was coming. I think it was Tanny and uh, Joe Ostrowski who had to work that. I was like, I'm good. Yeah. Well, um, and then and then they uh, had uh, the whole for, during COVID. They had the whole reuniting of uh, t- uh, Tanny and uh, Joe on the yeah. air and everything uh, to replay that game because that was what we were doing during COVID time. Was hey, remember all these games that you watched before? <laughs> remember then, all these games uh, you remember? Joe absolutely detested being the board up for White Sox baseball. Any because it was. Way below his level, as you see now, Joe Ostrowski is one of the smartest betting minds in the world, and he was like, "Ugh, this is terrible." Finally, he got his just due. Yeah, I uh, I hate I hated doing uh, Cubs games, <laughs> especially the the days where you'd show up at six a.m. do a little hit and run with uh, Matt Spiegel or uh, you know whoever was filling Not, in that day. Ugh, and Matt then, Spiegel. No, I know, but then ugh, six o'clock in the morning, and then it'd be a one ten start, so we'd go until twelve forty five, so it would already be three hours and forty five minutes, and then we'd get into the game, and then it'd be like a four hour game. So then I'm basically spending thirteen hours of a Sunday at the score. Oh boy, um, a lot better when Mark Burley was on the mound. Uh, final memory I just want to bring up: uh, twenty fifteen July six, Chris Sale versus Mark Burley, uh, and it goes an hour fifty four. My friends, Mark Burley pitches eight innings, nine hits allowed, four runs none earned two strikeouts and chris sale nine innings pitched six hits two earned runs uh no walks six strikeouts and the Sox win four to two um and that was getting three runs in the final uh inning the eighth inning and uh who else uh was driving in those runs but jose abreu with a single driving in gordon beckham yes um but uh you know, that that was also my favorite part about Mark Burley is man work quick. I mean, AJ says, got to see Mark Burley pitch in game two of the World Series. I was a tiny kid, but it felt like the whole, my whole life was coming full circle already. I mean, these things that White Sox fans have, they remember the day where they were when he pitched that perfect game versus Tampa Bay or what he did in opening day. I remember the day. Because it's one, it's my second favorite day of all time. Because it's the first day. The second fa- favorite day of all time is April fourth, two thousand five. My first favorite is October twenty sixth, two thousand five. Same year. Weird. Mark Burley pitches a, I think, complete game, um, one nothing winner versus the Cleveland Indians, and that's where I think the play between the legs comes from that day too, where he uh, shuffles his uh, kicks it off his foot and then t- uses his glove to get it right to Canerco just to beat the runner. And yeah, Paul, he caught it barehanded, right? That's one of my favorite memories. The other one was in 2007. And yes, Canerco did catch that barehanded. The other one was in 2007. When I was at the game. He wasn't pitching that game, but Gene Honda got on the uh, PA mic and announced that uh, Mark Burley was signing an extension with the White Sox, oh. and the place went nuts. That's just awesome. Could you imagine, though? Like, I mean, even for Lance Lynn, if Lance, if you were in there, Gene Honda comes out and he's like, oh, we have a special announcement. <laughs> Lance Lynn has signed an extension. Or if they do that with, like, Andrew Vaughn. I mean, come on. I'd, I'd faint if they, if Gene Honda told me Andrew Vaughn signing an extension. Uh, shout out Gene Honda, too, who's also doing the PA announcement for the Maui Jim Maui Invitational. Yes. Um, Alex Root texted me that and was like, it's weird hearing Al- uh, Jim Honda or Gene Honda do uh, the PA for the uh, Maui he, Invitational. He usually is the voice of the Final Four, but then... Jim Nance takes over when they do the introductions, which is dumb because Gene Honda is Gene Honda. He's, he's the best at his business. He's got the greatest voice in Number the history 35, of the world. Frank Thomas. Number 14, Paul Conarco. Um, Let's get into our mock ballots right after we tell you about our good friends over at Green Ridge Farm. They're a Chicago local meat and cheese company offering you a better all-natural option. These options come at tailgating time. They come at happy hour, school lunches. Maybe you're watching some uh, football on a Sunday. Uh, These makers of all-natural deli meat, sausage, and famous meat sticks have 
recipes that have been generations in the making and you could taste them uh, when you take a bite into their very crispy, snappy, delicious meat. Uh, all of them are smoked, especially their meat sticks. Their all natural meat sticks are hardwood smoked for eight hours. They have 16 grams of protein per stick and they come in chicken, black forest beef and flavors like jalapeno and spicy uh, jalapeno cheddar and spicy chili. Got to let you know about that cheddar. Uh, you should also try the sausages of the jalapeno cheddar one because it's just like a meat stick but bigger it's crazy um but you should also put some mustard on there because you also get some green rich farm mustard herb mm -hmm. likes the champagne honey mustard mm -hmm. i like the chipotle mustard i mean you really can't go wrong i mean you're set up with the brats here you're set up with your sausages you're set up with your deli meats and you're, you're making a ham sandwich for yourself you can go get that at the jewels green rich farm is offering you a better all-natural option at snack time at lunchtime, whenever so right now when you order any three meat products at greenrichfarm.com and include a pack of meat sticks in your cart those meat sticks will be free simply by using code chgo at checkout again when you order any three meat products at greenrichfarm.com and include a pack of meat sticks in your cart those meat sticks will be free simply by using code chgo at checkout and again you can find them in your refrigerator section at costco sam's club or in your local chicago Chicago Land Grocery Store. I know at my deli at the Jewels, they got some Green Ridge Farm turkey. They got some Green Ridge Farm ham. So definitely check them out at your local grocery store. Green Ridge Farm, simple, simply natural meat. And then ComEd is our person that lights all these buildings. And the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities we serve save money and energy. ComEd offers free facility assessments that can help find energy-saving opportunities, whether it's lighting, HVAC system, commercial equipment, or industrial processes. And an authorized engineer will work with you to develop a plan, detailed assessment plan specific to your goals and needs. These can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours. Within three to four weeks, customers will receive a report detailing energy efficiency pro projects that they can start working on immediately. And each recommendation will include estimated energy savings, cost savings, project costs, potential incentives, and simple payback. So don't wait. Get started saving money and energy today. For energy saving tips and to schedule your free facility assessment, go to comed.com slash powering B-I-Z. It's comed.com slash powering B-I-Z. And if you're ready to sign up for a facility assessment, call us at 1-855-433-2700. That's 1-855-433-2700 during normal business hours to speak with a comed energy efficiency program representative or email business ee at comed.com or request an assessment online at our website comed.com slash facility assessment thank you comed for powering this show now let's get into our mock ballots here herb do you want to take it first uh, yes. first let's show do we have the clear ballot okay let's show the first clear ballot and we'll go through uh these names Bobby Abreu, Bronson Arroyo, Carlos Beltran, Mark Burley, Matt Cain, R.A. Dickey, Jacoby Ellsbury, Andre Ethier, J.J. Hardy, Todd Helton, Tory Hunter, Andrew Jones, um, Jeff Kent, John Lackey, uh, Mike Napoli, Jehani Peralta. I know it's Johnny, but Jehani. Uh, Andy Pettit, Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, Francisco Rodriguez, K-Rod, Scott Rowland, and K-Rod and Francisco Rodriguez are the same people. I just wanted to... That's K-Rod. Um, Jimmy Rollins, Gary Sheffield, Houston Street, Omar Varscal, Billy Wagner, Jared Weaver, and Jason Worth. Uh, a lot of new names on there and a lot of old names not on there. Most importantly, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Kurt Schillings. This guy's been on there for like 10 years and now they're finally off. Yep. So uh, what do you make of this ballot? And uh, you kind of liken that there's not too many steroid guys you got to worry about because even Ortiz is gone. He was voted in. Yeah, there's no slam dunk candidate that you're going to get 80 90 percent on all the writers for this one i don't think um there should be with my ballot you you'll you'll see soon but um i just think that this year is a good year for mark burley to put up some numbers because of the rest of the people are not that you know they're hall of fame worthy most of them but they're not like oh that's a slam dunk he's a hall of famer in this list and so i go with Carlos Beltran, the fact that he's not in already, I think it's people like he's going to get in eventually. And my guy, Brendan McCaffrey, one of his favorite players of all time. I mean, ask any White Sox fan about Carlos Beltran. His career was complete. It was awesome. Mark Burley, of course, is my second guy. Todd Helton, yes, he, were, he was out there in Colorado, but he was playing in Colorado. Where else could he play? That's who drafted him. That's who he signed back with and his numbers play. Uh, Andrew Jones, I've already said it. He is the best 
defensive center fielder ever. That's not an overstatement. He is literally the best center fielder ever. So he should be in. He has over 400 home runs. He should be in already. It's egregious that he's not. Manny Ramirez, I don't give a damn. If we're already letting his teammate, mm-hmm. David Ortiz, who we know did steroids too, in the first ballot, what the hell is Manny Ramirez doing out of the, the Hall of Fame? He is a better hitter. He was mo- probably one of the most fearsome right-handed hitters of his time. Both of the A-Rod and K-Rod are in for me. A-Rod, self-explanatory. Yes, he did steroids. The numbers play. And K-Rod, one of the best closers of all time, holds the record for most saves in a season. He's in. Uh, Scott Rowland, look at the numbers. Third baseman, um, few and far between, there's better third baseman in that era than Scott Rowland. And he did it both with the Phillies and he did it with the Cardinals. He was a solid bat and a great glove, man. Uh, Gary Sheffield, another guy that got some steroid stink on him. But the numbers play also there. And uh, last guy is Billy Wagner, one of the most dominant closers in the history of the game and probably one of the best left-handed closers of all time. Yeah, I would agree 100% with mostly all of those votes. Uh, the Manny Ramirez one is interesting just because I, I, Manny, I think there's a little bit more fire to where his steroid stuff has come from. David Ortiz, though, similarly to Sammy Sosa, mm-hmm. um, who was just had his final year on the ballot as well. Um, Sammy Sosa and David Ortiz were named in the same New York Times article mm-hmm. for testing positive for steroids even though it was supposed to be an anonymous test. Yep. And I don't think they actually said the substance. They just said he, they tested positive. Um, so there's a lot of inconsistency with Ortiz's reporting, but there's also inconsistency with Sosa's reporting. Just look at uh, Ortiz's Minnesota days and then look at his Boston days. Right. Um, I, I just think that there's not enough there to keep Manny Ramirez out. Um, and I think that there is enough to keep probably Alex Rodriguez out, but I also don't care. No. Like, I don't give a shit once you broke the seal and david ortiz is in the hall of fame there you you either don't care that he did steroids or you don't think he did even though it's been reported and you use that same thing against sammy sosa to keep him out right which is odd right and you because he smiles he's big poppy yeah big poppy i'm happy yeah so he gets in but manny ramirez is a little more curmudgeon he's uh not as good a a field by the way he actually field, field his position, unlike David Ortiz, and you don't vote him in because of reasons. I don't know why. It's dumb. The only reason he should be in is because he hit a ton of home runs and because he was ridiculously good at baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, when he went to the Dodgers and took over Los Angeles and had Manny Wood screaming out in left field with his 221 OPS plus in 53 games after he was traded to the Dodgers. Um, just like the stupid numbers. I remember I mean, that the ridiculous stuff. I was with my Cub fan friends at uh, D'Agostino's right there in Wrigleyville Thanks. and he hit this I think it was a grand slam it was pretty much on the ground he just murdered the ball down in Wrigley we can kind of hear the silence and then the stream of people walking from Wrigley Field past us on Diagostinos which is I think on Southport and uh, Ash and uh, Addison and we saw them just walking past my Cub fan friends were just distraught well and our guy AJ saying White Sox legend too uh, Manny Ramirez's last home run came in a White Sox uniform only right that was Kelly Green his only White Sox home run, his last home run of his career, came in the white pinstripe, or the, the white jerseys with the Kelly Green pinstripes. Wow. It was on halfway to St. Paddy's Day. A legend, an Irish legend, my friends. Um, but, and I remember the, the kerfuffle, and I know this is off the point, the kerfuffle, like, oh, we're getting Manny Ramirez? I know Jerry doesn't like that long hair. I'm going to have to cut it off. Manny's like, nah, I'm not cutting off. And he's like, all right, we're not cutting off. <laughs> play he play cut ball. Off like a yep. little bit. I thought it was just a little bit he cut off. Yeah, play ball. He cut it to his shoulder. Um, yeah, that, it was still popping out his his helmet. Ridiculous. So like you might you might like the Yankees, but you ain't the Yankees. You ain't doing the same thing, and they ain't cutting their hair for you, White Sox. No, with your three championships. Um, yeah, and the the big thing too is like, I saw two thousand games Alex Rodriguez played. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, like I understand that like yes, we've broken the seal on the Hall of Fame, but like did they, those games just not happen? Like, am I just not supposed to, like, admit that even without steroids that he admitted that he took and served time for? And, yes, he lied about it, but he also was – he. there was, like, multiple interviews where he said, no, I did that shit. So, like, I mean, I don't know. There seems to be some remorsefulness there. How much you want to believe it, that's your own choice. But, again, I saw over 2,000 
games played by Alex Rodriguez. I saw over 600 home runs hit by Alex Rodriguez, over 3,000 hits. This man was one of the best hitters of all time and played a really damn good third base. Yep. Um, so Alex Rodriguez should be a Hall of Famer. I don't really care too much about the, the steroids stuff, but let's look at my ballot real quick. Um, and we'll get into some more New York, Chicago discussion actually in a second. Um, but Bobby Abreu, Carlos Beltran, Mark Burley, Todd Helton, Andrew Jones, Andy Pettit, Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, Scott Rowland, and Billy Wagner are all of my votes. Um, you know, I mean, Bobby Abreu, I think, was very underrated for his ability to steal bases, to walk, and to hit home runs. Carlos Beltran, I think, is the only player with Barry Bonds, Willie Mays, to have over 300 stolen bases and 300 home runs. Uh, Mark Burley, his three games facing the minimum – his save in the World Series, his complete game in the World Series, or whatever he did in, uh, it was a complete game, right, in Game 2? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. his complete game in, in Game won. 2. Um, he didn't really have well, those. Well, no, the Game 2, I, no, Game 2, he, he didn't win that game. He started that game. I don't think he won that game. I think that game was won in the, uh, that was the uh, uh, Pesednik home run. Yes. He was that, not in at that time, I don't believe. Okay, it, Neil Cotts got the win. Thank yeah. you. Um, and, oh, funny enough, I didn't know Andy Pettit was the other. Other pitcher in that game. Yeah, Andy um, sucks. He went seven innings in that one. Um, Even though you got him in the Hall of Fame. I, well, so here's the thing. Uh, can we and can we go to the blind resume here? Um, so here are two pitchers here that are on the ballots. Um, and we got their B war, their F war, their ERA plus, their FIP, and their ERA. Um, so on the left side, player A has 59.1 baseball reference war. They have a 52.3 fan graphs war, an ERA plus of 117 a FIP of 411, and an ERA of 381. Player B has a B war of 60.2, so basically no difference between player A and player B there. Uh, a little advantage to player B. Uh, an F war, 68.2 for player B, so about a, what, 16 war difference there yeah. between B and A. ERA plus is the same at 117. The FIP for player B is 374, so player A was 411. Player B, 374, and ERA, 385 for Player B. The Player A's ERA was 385. So who would you look at that and say, who's the Hall of Famer? Well, I already know who these two players are. Yeah, I gave it away. I would, but the F-War thing is the what because the Fangrass puts stock more into strikeouts and such. So mm -hmm. Andy Pettit's Player B, Mark Burley's Player A. Yes. Um, and so I marked down... Andy Pettit for steroid use. Yes, I like that he came clean eventually and did a mea culpa, but you did it. You used these steroids for however long to lengthen your career to pitch just as well as a guy that didn't take it. And I know people are like, well, the postseason record. What can Mark Burley do about his shite organization? They went to the playoffs three times. His rookie year in 2000, 2005, and 2008. It's that's it. Like, how can Mark, like, he didn't perform, like, per, specifically, like, well in all those games. I think he has, like, a 4-11 or 5 ERA in those uh, appearances. But Andy Pettit had a lot of chances to go to the playoffs with great teams of the Yankees and the Astros. So to mark off Mark Burley because he didn't go to the playoffs because his organization and his teammates weren't as good as Andy Pettit's, it's just kind of odd. I just think you got to mar match off. Stat for stat, regular season for regular season. And if you say Mark, uh, Andy Pettit is a Hall of Famer, then Mark Burley is a Hall of Famer. And even more, Mark Burley is a Hall of Famer because you know he didn't take, take steroids. You know he did it on the level. Well, and that's that's the thing, too, is, I mean, and it's a little bit different, but Andy Pettit wasn't like he was, you know, a, a nobody. Andy Pettit was a, a pretty hot shot prospect, and I understand that he was taken in the 22nd round, but he was also a high schooler, um, signed out of high school, so this was kind of a, a, a lower, later signing, but he was drafted in 1990, and then five years later was a 23-year-old starting pitcher for the for the, for the the Yankees, uh, placed third in Rookie of the Year, so I mean, he was a, a, a top prospect, was with a fantastic organization, mm -hmm. uh, draft, I mean, the Yankees started their uh, winning every winning season since 1992 in this stretch. I was stretch. literally going to say, like, what was the year that they didn't have a winning year? 1992. In 92. And so his whole career, his whole Yankee career, they were a winning team. Yes. Um. So, and Mark Burley, again, 38th rounder, but he was he drafted in 1998 and was immediately up. And yes, he went to college, but uh, was immediately up in 2000 for the White Sox. And I, I just think that 
you're looking at two completely different players. The strikeouts obviously are there for Pettit, but that wasn't Mark Burley's job. Mark Burley's job was to limit contact, limit hard hits as well, um, and then make sure that if he was getting guys on base, either getting ground balls to get uh, double plays or to hold them and, and not let them advance, not let them steal, pick them off if, if, if allowed to. Um, so I do want to go to some Burley stats just because I do think he's very interesting. First off, um, if Burley was elected in the Hall of Fame, just Burley, um, he'd be the 10th best left-handed pitcher in the Hall of Fame. Wow. According to Baseball Reference War. Amazing. Um, to be fair to Sandy Koufax, Sandy Koufax didn't have that long of a career. I would say, hearing all the tales about Sandy Koufax, probably better than Mark Burley, but still... Sandy Koufax has a less war than Mark Burley, so that's still a, a true fact there. Um, for pitchers who have pitched at least 3,000 innings in their career, Mark Burley has the eighth lowest stolen base percentage. And if you look at the top 10, the only other person that has a two in one of their years played is Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers pitched from 1989 to 2008 and had a stolen base percentage of 40.91% against him. Uh, Whitey Ford has the lowest stolen base percentage against him at 35.71%. Burley eighth all time at 42.1%. But Burley second in pickoffs all time behind Steve Carlton. But the thing about Steve Carlton, Steve Carlton liked to get box called on him. Steve Carlton had the most box called on him of all time, 90. Second was Bob Welch with 45. But Steve Carlton, 146 pickoffs. Burley second place with 100, but Burley only had 16 box. And as you brought up Joe West, most of those weren't even box. Nope. Because Joe West just didn't like Mark Burley. So Threw him out of the game. We could probably say that's 14 box there for, for, for Mark Burley. So Mark Burley um, really never made a mistake. He was always pretty perfect. His job was to limit hard contact. Um, was great at getting grounded in double plays as well. Um, Mark Burley, at least uh, top 15, uh, 13th most for ground, uh, for double plays grounded into by a hitter. Uh, 362, tied with Andy Pettit. Um, also has less games started than Andy, Andy Pettit. Uh, Mark Burley's one of 52 players who have started over 490 games. Mm -hmm. um, so that's rare category as well um, to be one of, you know, only about 52 pitchers to reach that milestone as well. Um, and then Mark Burley, um, I already mentioned the 10th uh, for a left-handed pitcher. Um, what was the other one? Uh, stolen base, walks. Uh, and then we'll mention the uh, defense as well. Um, 87 defensive run saves as a pitcher. So The his, most in the history most. As, since that stat has been created. Exactly. Um, and so if you add the defensive run saves, you add the pickoffs, you add the limiting of stolen bases. Four actual gold gloves that were earned. Four gold gloves, top 15 in ground, uh, uh, ground uh, double plays. I don't know why I keep trying to go GIDP. Uh, double plays. Um, and then final one, out of pitchers, and this is since 1969, and this is going to fan graph, so I'm not sure how long this stack goes back. It, not a lot of old names in here, so I think it only goes back to about 2001. So even then, since 2001, with pitchers who have at least pitched 1,000 innings and have a hard contact percent lower than 26%, Mark Burley leads in innings pitched. There are 25 pitchers, 25 pitchers to have pitched at least 1,000 innings and have a con hard contact percent uh, under 26%. Mark Burley has the most innings pitched at 3,010 innings and two-thirds. Tim Hudson second with 2,500 innings, uh, 2,500 uh, 2, uh, innings pitched. Roy Holiday third at 2,400 innings pitched. Barry Zito fourth, 225, uh, 2,220. 2,250 innings pitch. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, folks, sorry. Uh, and then Derek Lowe, fifth, sixth, Roy Oswald, seventh, Javier Vasquez, uh, eighth, John Garland, ninth, Carlos Zambrano, tenth, Greg Maddox. Um, and again, that's not including his Cy Young Ward, so it's not like Greg, Greg, Greg Maddox, like capital G, capital M Maddox. But um, Burley, just always limiting hard contact. And he had a ton of contact, like 84% throughout his career. Yep. But he wasn't always allowing that hard square up contact. He was basically Johnny Cueto in 2022, but for 14 straight seasons. Yep. Pitching and, 200 plus innings. And if Steven, you could put up the 200 inning uh, stat that I have up there. Uh, here's the list of players that have thrown 200 innings pitched in 14 consecutive seasons since 1901. Warren Spahn with 17, Gaylord Perry with 15, Don Sutton with 15, Phil Necro with 14, Maddox 14, Christy Matheson 14, Mark Burley. That's it in the history of the game since the 1901. Mm -hmm. He's like, notice everything about the other six. They are all enshrined in Cooperstown. If Burley had just recorded four more outs in his last season, 
his streak would have ran to 15 seasons and it would have been a class of four rather than seven. This is from fan side. And the next one, uh, Stephen, it's Mark Burley got outs, a lot of outs. No one recorded more outs than Mark Burley from 2001 to 2015. His 3,232 innings pitched over that span are the most by a wide margin. No one else pitched 33,000 innings in that time. Only two pitchers, CeCe Sabathia and Tim Hudson, are within 500 innings pitch of Mark Burley. That's a full season's worth of innings more than anyone else and two full seasons more than nearly all the rest of the most productive pitchers in the game. Like, Mark Burley is elite. He is an elite class of pitcher, even though he wasn't the best pitcher during his time. He was one of the pitchers that got the job done. He pitched the most innings during his time in the major leagues. And FIP isn't going to look good to him, and the, the fan graph numbers aren't going to look great for him because, God again, damn it, like you Fred. mentioned, um, strikeouts were, were really never there. But if you look at walks and hits per innings plus, like if you look at you know just amount of base runners allowed per inning, he was lower than Andy Pettit. I'm going to yell at Fred. So, like, well, no, no, he's he's saying that I nope. love Burley and always thought he was in the Hall of Very Good, mm-hmm. but your stats are making us reconsider. So that's making that's we're doing a good job. No, the Hall of Very Good is the worst thing in the world ever created. It's, it's fake. It's, I hate it. It's a fake thing. And uh, Stephen, do we have the other? Uh, I, I think it. I sent to production bash. team, or maybe I didn't. I don't hate you, Fred. Um, I love you. No, I didn't. Uh, there's one more. Th- screenshot that I want you to get to and it's kind of along the, the lines of Hall of Very Good um, but it's basically the, the amount of people being let in is just is, is too low. Um, this is from Jeremy Frank at MLB Random Stats and this is from 2020 so I don't know if this data is um, fully updated um, but the caption is, is the Hall of Fame becoming the Hall of Very Good by letting too many players in nowadays. Actually if anything it's been the opposite. In 1929, over 24% of all plate appearances were taken by future Hall of Famers. Just 4% of plate appearances in 2000 were taken by players in the Hall of Fame. So in 1929, it was 24%. In 2000, it was 4%. So there's just not enough players being let in. You could see this graph, Herb, like the amount of players. Oh, man. Um, the seasons uh, goes along the bottoms and the, the, the uh, what is that, the Y graphic, uh, the, the Y axis, um, percent of all league-wide plate appearances taken by Hall of Famers. And you could see basically, you know, after about 1970, it just crashes. So Mark Burley, I don't know if elite's the right word to use for him because I just think that Hall of Famers mean different things. Mark Burley did stuff that was very, very unique for a pitcher of his makeup, for his handedness. He was so elite at not letting that person on first base take that next base he was so good at that and yes you could talk about the diminished stuff but even just talk about the journey being 38th round draft pick like that deserves a part of the story in baseball lore Mm -hmm. if Mike Piazza you know obviously he's one of the greatest hitting catchers of all time but part of his lore is that late draft pick part of Tom Brady's lore is everyone overlooked him like there are so many different unique stories and not everyone could be Ken Griffey not everyone could be elite and you've known it since they were born you know some of these guys are hidden gems and I think that you have to honor some of that as well Mark Burley's a hidden gem because he pitched in Chicago because he was a late 38th round pick but also some of the stuff that he did is just hidden no one else is gonna pitch 3,000 innings again like he he did I mean that's that's rare no one's gonna pick pitch 14 straight seasons of 200 plus innings pitched and no one's gonna have three games of facing the minimum it Uh, hasn't happened in baseball history before it's not gonna happen again I want to add to that no one's ever gonna pick off anyone at the rate he did because the new rules coming up too yeah right um with the you know you can only throw their what three two times and then the third time and with the pitch clock too I want bigger bases I want to Give uh, credit to Jonas Toms, who uh, wrote the article that I cited. Um, but, yeah, 100 pickoffs in his career, I think only 58 stolen bases. Almost double the people he picked off than people who stole against him. In his career, that is amazing. Like, the 38-round thing, like, I'm glad you brought it up. It is a thing. Like, that is never going to happen again because we don't pick that many people anymore. But he pretty much... Went through the White Sox system in a year and a half. And he wasn't Chris Sale. And he wasn't Garrett Crochet throwing flame from the left side. He was just a reliever pretty much on that 2000 team, the kids can play team, that did a good job and then became a household name for the White Sox. He was just great. It was just um, 
a player that should be like an exception to, hey, was he one of the top five pitchers in his league ever? They should be the exception because of all the stats we've talked about. And if you're going to let players in, you said there's about nine other players that are better than him and left as a left-hander. Mm-hmm. Well, according to War, I mean, Sandy Koufax is below him in War. There's, there's been Sandy Koufax is more player. than 20,000 players in the history of Major League Baseball. You've let in only nine better than Sandy Koufax and other players. Better War than Mark Burley? Come on now. The man did more with less than any player I can uh, think of at all in Major League Baseball. Um, oh, this is a fun stat, too. Uh, you brought up the, the, the stolen bases uh, here. Um, so least amount of stolen bases, uh, we're not going to count Ed Walsh and Billy Bill Donovan, uh, not Billy Donovan, uh, who in 1918 and 1917 had three stolen bases and five stolen bases against them. Uh, but we'll go to uh, maybe Johnny Cueto, who I would say is the modern day holder of this record. Whitey Ford and Christy Matheson are up there too, but maybe Whitey Ford, I guess, is. Uh, Whitey Ford had 30 stolen bases against him. But seventh on this list, Johnny Cueto. 41. So that's kind of interesting. AJ say he's kind of the last of the uh he's kind of the last of his kind, you know. Yeah. Johnny Cueto is kind of that same ilk. Yeah, it's like you're saying AJ, kind of how like Devin Hester and his touchdown record for kick returns and punt returns probably won't be broken even though Cordero Patterson's getting up there. This Mark Broly stat so where he's picking off 100 and only giving up 58 strike uh 58 won't be broken. His pace of game won't be broken. Um, the amount of innings he threw, the 14 consecutive years of 200 innings plus will not come close to be broken, not cl- close to being even coming matched because you saw all the numbers there. Those are all historic Hall of Famers that he's in the same class with. So put him in the exclusive hall where he is – deserving to be amongst those people i agree and hey if uh game time was around back in 2009 i know my dad and i would have been rolling up on july 23rd pulling up on our game time app uh because game time is the hottest new ticketing site that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on the tickets to sports concerts and shows you never thought you dreamed you could be sitting at uh, i you know I've, I've never been 50 yard line but i was close and i paid five hundred dollars for 100 level sections mm-hmm. uh at a bears game now coming up against the packers we have the chgo tailgate uh happening at 8 30 as well in roosevelt michigan uh, if you do want to come by but if you're thinking oh i mean it's probably super expensive to go sit at a bears packers game at the 50 yard line well game time you'll find the biggest last minute price drops that can be found on seats you never thought you could buy you won't find a better deal this season on bears tickets because it was created by the fans for the fans, and they guarantee the lowest price for that reason. Herb has dealt with their customer service. They are fantastic. In under 12 minutes, he showed them the tickets on a different site that were cheaper, and they said, all right, here's your money. I did that same thing when I bought the Northwestern tickets this week, Northwestern Illinois tickets. I bought the tickets, went to all the sites. Guess who was the cheapest? Game time. Game time. Who? Guaranteed. Um, Guaranteed. And if they are not the cheapest, they get that money back in that account really quickly. 12 minutes. There you go. And if you love CHGO, then you love Game Time. The best way to support us is by buying your tickets to the link in the description. Join over 15 million people, 15 million who have downloaded the Game Time app and score the best seats to all your favorite events. Our next partner is Shady Rays. They never understood why sunglasses were so expensive, so they set out to change it. You don't have to break the bank for quality sunglasses this fall because our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. I like that because shade, cover, you know. I got what they uh, did there. Shade rays are premium polarized shades featuring world-class optical clarity, substantial durability, and styles catered to everyone in every lifestyle. Our guy, Greg Boyson, has been a uh, consumer of theirs. Yeah. Uh, uh, for a very long time and when our guy Chris who got the deal with Shady Rays announced like hey we're gonna have them on board Greg was so excited and uh, I know why now holding these in our hands uh, they're just like Herb's very very expensive sunglasses but they're they're very very cheap Uh, it's that's well they're cheaper Uh, yes they're 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 affordable that's 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 the word Um, because now they're running their deepest deal of the season use code CHGO for 50% off two or more pairs at ShadyRays.com that's buy one 
get one free. You can get two pairs for as low as $54. Redeem only at ShadyRays.com where you can find all their newest and best shades. I did use that C word. I meant affordable because that C word probably means flimsy. Yeah, people get the wrong idea when you use the words right cheap instead. They're affordable. They're affordable. Inexpensive. They have over 200,000 five-star reviews. And again, the durability of them, you could feel in your hands. The optical clarity is just like any other top sunglasses. These are top sunglasses just not at a top sunglasses price. So and that means it's a good deal, friends. Buy one, get one free. Use code CHGO at ShadyRace.com. And guys, right now they have their Black Friday sale up to 60% off everything. My friend Mark, actually, he used our promo code CHGO at Shady Rays. He got two pairs of sunglasses, pretty much buy one, get one free. And for an extra $19, he got a mystery pair. He just sent me the picture today. Here it is. The one on the right oh. is the mystery pair. So That's those are really cool. nice. Too. The one on the right? Yeah, all oh, the way wow. on the right. Oh man, actually, those might be my favorite ones. Actually, what about man, Mark, look at Steve, but look at Steven too, bringing bringing stuff for the ad reads. Exactly, They're not even telling me. And Mark supporting us too, yeah, and he is a frequent watcher. He could be watching right now, Mark. Hi, Mark. If you're watching, please please comment. I love you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we appreciate you. We also appreciate Foco uh, because they make Dallas Keiko bobbleheads and everything a fan could need. If you are looking for something for the huge sports fan in your life this holiday season uh, you've already got the best coverage for your favorite teams that's us so get fitted in the best sports gear around foco has you covered from soldier field to the living room north or south side with hoodies slippers signs bobbleheads and everything in between get decked out like tomorrow with apparel from the leaders in sports merch and collectibles foco that's f-o-c-o if you're looking for the perfect gift for the football fan in your life foco's got you covered with hoodies to fight that lake michigan breeze so check out foco.com again that's f-o-c-o.com or click the link in the description below and for all non-presale items. Use the promo code CHGO for 10% off. I love that they bring up the South Side because I will be back uh, in my hood hopefully tomorrow, seeing some family for the for the holidays. Very excited for that. Very excited to eat some South Side pizza. My lord, I have missed it. The North Side just doesn't. Going to do Los it. Angeles? Um, that's that's Jay Zawaski's place. I don't know if that's where we're gonna go. go to Palermo's. Palermo's is, is, a, is a top favorite of mine. Uh, Milano's uh, on uh, on Western Ave is very, very good. You should go out to Glen Ellen and get some Baronies. No. Delicious. Glen Ellen does not sound like a place that would deliver great pizza. Oh, it does. Baronies is top notch. Some of the best pizza I've ever had. Are you talking tavern style? Yeah. Hell yeah. How thin? Then is that you can make it? Okay, I mean I'm I, like I especially or maybe like Vito. Oh hey, why are you our guy back? Why are you? If it's a god awful Sox podcast, then just get out. He left because he's enjoying his wife on his honeymoon, which you don't have. He doesn't have to get out. I'll My do it friend. for us. Uh, no, it's fine. I was just kidding. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean I'm excited for the South Side. Uh, anyways, uh, that's good. You get to, you get to have a little time. Are you going to be participating in Blackout Wednesday? No. Okay. Oh yeah, Thank you're you. not a big time drinker anyway, not, Steven. Not a drinker. Yeah, I probably will. Okay, I'm gonna do that going, but I was just at 115 Bourbon Street, Marionette Park, the weekend. Yeah, I know. I know. Disgusting. It was. I used to work over there. I worked at the Jewel that was right next to Bourbon Street, and whenever we, I would work on a Friday or Saturday, everyone from Bourbon Street would come over, drunk, being like, "Hey, let's go get some, let's go get some snacks." I've been there a couple times. Let's go. Um, You speed Dominic's, Uh, but yeah, uh, Mark Burley. We bring up the the stat about. 200 straight innings and you bring up that he was so close he was at 198 and two-thirds in his last uh game and he went two-thirds of an innings uh in october 1st uh 2015 five hits allowed eight runs none of them earned one walk no strikeouts one home run uh so mark burley kind of got screwed in that last game because all he needed was you know one and two-thirds innings and his defense couldn't get him out of it uh and i just like when you're reading that I just recalled another Mark Burley moment that I recall so vividly. He was playing the Minnesota Twins in the Metro Dump. He gave up seven runs, I believe, in the first inning versus the Minnesota Twins. I don't know if they're earned or not. And the fact that Ozzy or Jerry Manuel or whoever left them in the game is a testament to him. The White Sox came back and won that game, and I think Mark Burley won the game because he pitched like six more innings or five more <laughs> innings after that. I was like... It's Mark Burley. Only Mark Burley could give up seven runs in the first inning and still win that game. And bounce back like that. Um, So final stuff on Burley and his candidacy. Uh, He did have a little bit of a poorer showing on his second year in the ballot. So his first year on the ballot was 2021. uh, And now my baseball Hall of Fame tracker is not loading. But shout out to Ryan Thibodeau, uh, who 
puts together the Baseball Hall of Fame tracker. Mm -hmm. um, does a great job. And he's got a, a large team with him, and they all do a fantastic job uh, tracking all of these stats from all these writers. But in the first year, Mark Burley got 32 votes, 9.6% of the votes on his first year in the ballot. There was 311 public ballots, um, and I think total... Uh, there was 333. So Mark Burley got 32 of 333 votes. That's 9.6%. To stay on the ballot, you need at least 5% of the vote, which was you know good news because in the second year on the ballot, Burley went down to 5.9%, only 19 votes of the 302 plus or 309 plus two of the 321 votes uh, cast. So 19 of 321 for Burley. He goes from 9% to 5.9%. Uh, the good news, I would say, is that the first timers on this list outside of Carlos Beltran really aren't that great. Uh, yep. JJ Hardy doesn't really stand out. Bronson Arroyo doesn't really stand out, right? There's no is really. Johanny Peralta is uh, the first timer. Johnny Peralta is a, a first timer as well. Um, the only one that I think. Jacoby we'll, Ellsbury. Jacoby Ellsbury. Uh, I think only one of the guys that will get like true votes from the first timers uh, will be. Andre Ethier. Uh No. <laughs> Will be Carlos Beltran, but even him, he's got the Astro stuff he uh, does. circulating him. So I do think that Burley will be safe. I do think that Burley will get this 5% of the vote. And hey, uh, if you want to yell at Joe Colley more, which I know people do, Joe Colley in 2021 voted for Mark Burley for the Hall of Fame. 2022 did not. Our guy Teddy Greenstein, who has been on CHGO Bets Daily, did not vote for Mark Burley in 2022. If you are a Chicago baseball writer and you have a baseball Hall of Fame vote and you are not voting for Mark Burley, stop. Use all of your votes. Vote for 10 people. Let's get some more people in the Hall of Fame because it doesn't need to be this exclusive class like you were saying earlier. Um, come on. I mean, Joe Colley, he was on Locked on Socks with you uh, back in the day. Yep. Voted for him in 2021, and then in 2022, Joe's like, I'm cool. I don't know if he didn't vote for Mark Burley because of all the people he needed to vote in because of that was their last time on the ballot, like Barry Bonds, uh, Mark McGuire, and et cetera, Sammy Sosa. But I would assure you this year, Joe Colley, which I still don't know, and he, I think, has said this, why he still has a vote. He's not a baseball writer anymore. Neither is Teddy Greenstein. And a lot of people who have votes for the BBWAA uh, Hall of Fame ballots are not baseball writers anymore, so they shouldn't have a vote. So I don't understand why, like he, this year, I think, you know, he loved Burley. He loved covering him, loved talking to him, all that stuff. He'll vote for him this year because of what you just said. Only Beltron is really standing out in this class, and you got to give love to Mark Burley if you're looking at this uh, class. I think so. I mean, I'm biased, but Mark Burley, we just went through the reasons. He should be a Hall of Famer eventually. Hell, if Jerry Reinsdorf and Tony Goddamn Larusa got Harold Baines in the damn Hall of Fame, why not an actual better player that might deserve it on, on his own merit? Get him in. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you, uh, and I'm for it. And uh, the projections would say about 16 votes would keep Mark Bale Mark Burley on the. Uh, ballot so that's the that. that's the main thing uh he's can spend 10 years on the ballot and i think what's most important is just keep keeping him on the ballot and just keeping that exposure keeping him uh as far as he can be on there because jim cott just got voted into the hall of fame mark burley's got so much better numbers than than jim cott so as long as he gets to some of these later voting stages some of these veteran committees I think there's a chance for him to get in the Hall of Fame, but keeping him on the ballot for as long as he can is the biggest, biggest victory. So 16 votes is what we're looking for. This, I think he's this, getting at least up to 25% this year. Because 25%? Of the, yeah, because of the well, lack jump. Yeah, because of the lack of uh, good quality candidates out here that are, like, sure. I hope this year it's going to be – it might be a short class. I hope that Andrew Jones finally gets his respect. And I hope Carlos Beltran gets his respect. Those two guys, I think it's egregious to leave them out of the hall for any time longer. Yeah, I well, I mean, so I, I would expect at least we saw numbers of voters dipping. So it, this might be a, a number, you know, instead of people mailing in votes, we just might see less voters um, ballot wise. So maybe 25 percent will be doable for, for Burley, but he'd need about like 75 votes for 25 percent. Got 32 before, so he'd need a huge swing uh, in, in what happened last year. So it would be difficult to get to that 25%, but I'm I'm not against it. And thanks, Again, Al. We laid out, we laid out the, the reasoning. And, uh, yeah, appreciate you, Al. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get too annoyed uh, at, the, at the one guy. But it's just funny because it's the same guy. Like I said, we have 
I've been doing YouTube for a while now. Um, in, it wasn't the same amount of exposure. We're at 22,000 subscribers, by the way, on CHGO Sports. So make sure you subscribe. We do really, really appreciate all of you guys. I was hanging out with us. AJ, Fred, Caleb, Fred, again, uh, Alrad uh, as well. Uh, Russ did, of course. Uh, but all these diehard Sox fans, Steven yes. and Duke oh my God, as well. Duke. Um, Slash Poppy. But, you know, 22,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, and we the other channel I had was like 17,000. There was a lot more hate on that one uh, than this White Sox one. I mean, the only real trolls we deal with are when the White Sox lose. And it's like Guardians fans coming in here and be like, L, 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 L. Uh, so I'll take all of the uh, the fantastic people, uh, like Schlesh Poppy as well. As long as you're A, that man tuned in, in here and gave us a view, us. But it's uh, and weird. to tell us that we're bad. I appreciate he, that. He's, awesome. he's tuned in now, I think, like four times over the past month Maybe. My and man's. commented, awful Sox podcast. Why do you come back? No, I know. Are you I, that bored? No, I love it. I <laughs> hey, the man's in, enjoying our product. He, haters don't act like this. He enjoys our product. He just wanted to be different and get it read. So let's uh, ignore him from here on out and give some more love to my man Schles Poppy or Fred or yeah. Fred or Fred or, or Al. Fred. Did you mention Fred or Caleb? Um, yeah, that's fine. I think Stephen blocked him anyways. Uh, looking by this, the, I did. The, the, the smile did. on Stephen's face behind the camera. Uh, anyways, we appreciate everyone who has jumped in and supported the podcast. And hopefully we let you know a little bit more about Mark Burley's candidacy for the Hall of Fame. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. Thank you to Stephen Nicholas for producing the show today. And we appreciate, uh, again, everyone in the chat like Fred and Fred and Fred and Fred and Fred. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. We will talk to you tomorrow. Go Sox.